example is that extrinsic rewards really interfere with children's motivation to learn over the long run, and hence they should be avoided. A first study showing this, which really surprised the world of, of psychology, was a study in which children were, had markers placed in their classrooms to, to use. They were nursery school children, and these brand new sets of markers came in, and they watched what children really liked to use the markers a lot. Then they took these heavy marker-using children into the experiment room, and they showed them this fancy award that they had, had made. This was in the late 60s, early 70s, and children were quite interested in this award, which was a white note card that had a gold ribbon on it and a star and said, Good Player Award. And they showed it to children and they said, Would you like to win this award? And children said, Yes. And to the first group of children, they then said, Well, all you need to do is draw with these markers and you'll win this award. So the children studiously drew for six minutes and then with great fanfare, they were presented the award and they went back to their classroom. Second group of children came in, drew with the markers for six minutes, and then by surprise got the same award. And a third group of children came in, drew for six minutes, and went back to their classroom with no award. They were interested in two things. First of all, whose drawings were the most creative? Well, judges who were blind, in other words, didn't know which condition the children were in, looked at all these pictures and rated how creative they were. And they rated the pictures of the children in the first group who expected the reward and were drawing for the reward as significantly less creative than the drawings of the children in the other two groups. Second of all, they were interested in who, who still wanted to, to use the markers a lot a couple of weeks later. And when they went into the classrooms and they observed who was using the markers a lot two weeks later, they found that children in the first group were using them half as much as they used to and half as much as the children in the other two groups. So in other words, their interest in markers had very much declined following this presentation of an award for drawing with them. It was a very surprising finding because this was the, the heyday of behaviorism. It was actually just as behaviorism was, was declining. And rewards are the commerce of behaviorism. So suddenly here these rewards have been given and it's actually made children less interested in the activity. But two other labs in other parts of the world working with other ages of children came across similar findings at about the same time. So it was quite convincing and many, many studies since then have shown the same thing, that when people expect a reward for something that they already were motivated to do, they subsequently, once the with reward is withdrawn, lose interest in that activity. And that's just the kind of situation that children face in school, right? So they go off to first grade, they're all excited about learning, they can't wait to learn, it seems like such a great thing. But we know that children's interest in learning in school declines every year that they're in traditional schools. And there are certainly many reasons for this, but I think the extrinsic rewards, where they get the grade, they get the gold star, it makes them all happy, but then next time maybe they don't get such a good grade or they don't get a gold star, that motivation can start to cease. Second set of research showing that extrinsic rewards are problematic for learning is studies that use insight problems. So in some studies using insight problems, say for example the Dunker's candle problem where people are given a candle and a matchbook and some thumbtacks and they're asked how they would light a, a room with this. Um, when they're told that they will get a dollar for each insight problem that they solve, it takes them significantly longer to, find, to solve them and they solve significantly fewer of them than when they're just solving them for free, not for, for any sort of award. The way that you solve that, by the way, is you take the thumbtack and you stick it in the matchbox, which you put on the wall, and you melt a little bit of wax into the bottom of the box and set the candle in it. So, then a third area in which we see problems with extrinsic rewards is pro-social behavior. Children who are told that they can solve, uh, they can help some children in a hospital by sorting papers for them um, and that they'll get a, a reward for doing so. Later, when they're given an opportunity to sort papers on, on their own, are significantly less likely to engage in that pro-social behavior at the later time point, having been rewarded at the first time point, than children who were never rewarded for sorting papers for children in the hospital at all. And we also know that children whose parents give them more positive feedback for, being, for doing nice things for other children are less likely to do nice things for other children than parents who just sort of look the other way as their children engage in empathetic behaviors. 
We also know that people are, will avoid challenge more often when they know they're going to be getting an extrinsic reward. So you see this, you know, it's commonplace in, in selecting college courses that students will avoid the courses that they know are hard to get a good grade in and go for the ones that they'll get an easier grade in. And this has been seen in laboratory studies as well. So when children are able to select how difficult of a task or di how difficult of a puzzle they want to do, if they're told that they're going to be evaluated or rewarded for doing those puzzles, they pick easier ones than if they're not. So extrinsic rewards have many different problems, and with all of this, I talk about many more studies in the book than I can talk about here. There are many more studies in, in my book on the problems with extrinsic rewards. That just gives you a bit of a flavor of the problem, and yet our school systems are founded on this approach. Mark Lepper, who is one of the main researchers in this area, when writing a summary of it a few years ago, said, when the results of this literature were described to audiences of educators who work primarily with young children, the typical response was unadulterated approbation. These teachers clearly understood the phenomenon under discussion and thought that research documenting such effects was long overdue. But by contrast, when these same findings were described to educators who themselves work primarily with older children, a second prototypic response began to appear. Although these teachers would often grant the importance of the phenomenon, they were quick to point out its lack of relevance to their own classroom situations. After all, they routinely indicated, children in their classes rarely displayed any intrinsic motivation whatsoever. There was simply nothing to be undermined. It's a very, very sad but, but true comment on the state of schooling today. Montessori saw these problems. She said the prize and the punishment are incentives towards unnatural or forced effort which may turn an individual aside from their true vocation. So in a Montessori classroom then, there are no extrinsic rewards. Children are interested in doing the activities and that's why they do them. But these extrinsic rewards in traditional schools don't simply serve to motivate children. They're also supposed to be serving as a means for evaluation. Now, children, of course, see them as sort of a, a prize or a punishment, I think, a lot of the times. Even college students will say, you gave me a grade rather than I earned a grade. But um, they do have a function in terms of evaluation. And evaluation is a very important aspect of what teachers need to do. And in, this holds in a Montessori classroom as well. Teachers need to look at children and evaluate whether they're learning what they're supposed to be learning. So how do you do this when you take away grades is the puzzle. Well, teachers do it in a variety of ways in Montessori classrooms. For one thing, they observe children and they observe what they're doing and they can know how well they're doing based simply on watching them and, and seeing this. So, one reason this works in Montessori is because the work is all about movement in these materials that are laid out. And a teacher can simply walk past a child and see whether they're using a material correctly. It's very different from if the child is bent over a worksheet and the only way a teacher can know if a child's doing it right is to read the worksheet and then they usually put red X's on, right? But um, they can just see if a child's using a material well. And if they're not using it properly, rather than going in at that moment and correcting the child, the normal course for a Montessori teacher is just to note it and later to represent that material or to have an older child come and present the material. Because there's something that seems to work better for children when an older child comes along and corrects them when, than when an adult does. Again, this would be an interesting area for study. So evaluation is in part accomplished in a Montessori classroom then by the teacher being able to observe what the child is doing. Second is the three period lesson which is used in Montessori to get nomenclature across. So a teacher will first present a new vocabulary word, say rhombus, to a child and then that's the first period and then later they will ask the child, can you give me the rhombus? So getting the child's recognition memory and then third, in the third period they'll say, which one is this, pointing to the rhombus, and the child needs to come up with the term. So the three-period lesson then allows the teacher to see how the child is learning nomenclature. The children don't feel like they're being tested. It feels more like a conversation, but it lets the teacher know how the child's doing. And then finally, evaluation in Montessori classrooms often comes from the child themselves. It's a self-evaluation, and the children are able to do it because the materials are designed with something that Montessori terms control of error in them. 
If you think about the wooden cylinders earlier, where the child took out the 10 cylinders and put them back in, the child knows if they made an error when they get to that last cylinder and it doesn't fit. And they have to be very puzzled and figure it out and figure out, you know, what did I do wrong so that it doesn't work this time. Many of the materials have that built in. So for example, this child is using the sound cylinders and there are pairs and the child shakes them and sees which, one, which ones match up. It helps to educate the child's sense of hearing and helps lead them along with language. But when the child reaches the last pair of cylinders and they don't match up, then they know that they made an error earlier in the game. There'll also be control maps, for example, with the geography work. So a child will have worked on drawing a map and then they can go over and get a control map and see if they've done it correctly. In many Montessori classrooms for mathematics now, they have calculators in and the child will do the work by hand but then check themselves on a calculator. So the child is able to do a lot of self-evaluating. And of course, in a traditional classroom, people worry about cheating in situations like that, but in a Montessori classroom, what's the point of cheating? There, there are no grades involved. It's about your own learning and your own interest. Montessori said, all the crosses made by the teacher on the child's written work have only a lowering effect on his energies and interests. 